how much money you made did not matter. It's what you did with your money that truly made that difference. But we tell ourselves the more money you make, the better it's going to be. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't change your habits, you're just going to have more expensive expenses, you know? So we really have to look at where is the money going? What are we doing? And what little changes can we do year after year to improve our overall finances? Welcome or welcome back to the Bombshell Business Podcast. I'm your host, Amber Hurdle, and today we're going to be talking about a topic that I think so many of us bombshells and even you bombshell boys struggle with. And if we don't struggle with it, maybe we just don't have a lot of clarity around it. But repeatedly over the years, I know that this issue is an issue and that is money. So we're going to unpack that today with someone who really used a lot of grit and determination, which you know those are two of my favorite things on the planet, to get to where she is. And now she helps other people get to where she is. And I'm being very vague because we're going to unpack her story in the show today. But first of all, let me read her bio to you, her official bio. As an enrolled agent and 20-year certified tax preparer, Suhei Piedra likes to make her clients' money work for them so they don't have to work forever. She supports high-earning service-based business owners achieve long-term wealth through a holistic approach to financial services, providing bookkeeping, tax preparation, financial planning, and tax strategy all under one roof. She also hosts and produces Tax Talk with Hey Hey Podcast. Please welcome to the show, Suhei Piedra. Welcome to the Bombshell Business Podcast. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for having me. So we've got a lot to unpack today, sis. Yes, money is one thing that people cringe, or taxes, I should say. We cringe when we hear the word taxes and IRS, right? The scary. That's that to <laughs> me as a as a recovering single mom syndrome person. That's I hear tax and IRS. I'm like, Whoa, what? You know, like I'm on edge. But you really come at this from a, I mean, in the wayback machine again, twenty plus years before this. Can you take us back because you're a six-figure business owner and you're a first-generation Mexican-American. And so what was it that happened in your life where you were like, yep, I'm going to get down on some numbers? <laughs> well, um, you know, it's not that I thought this is what I wanted to do, right? It was more of I had to. So being the oldest, uh, my parents being, you know, immigrants and not knowing the language or, you know, anything, uh, you know, how to do certain things. I learned how to run the household at a very young age. I was forced to learn how to pay bills, write checks, you know, balance a checkbook and stuff. Wow. Like it's not like I wanted to, you know, you're just kind of like, you have to do it. And so I, you know, I, well, I'm not going to say, oh, I was a whiz at math. That's not exactly how it worked. Um, I can hold my own. So my mom always thought that I would be a great attorney. And that's what I thought I wanted to be a really good attorney. But numbers just kept following me around. Taxes kept following me around throughout my throughout my life. And so I was forced to help my parents uh, with their tax return. I was maybe, gosh, I want to say I was like 12 or 13 years old. And back then you had to sign the returns and paper and mail them in. And he accidentally mismatched the envelopes with the returns and they didn't know what went where and they asked me to help and of course tax forms are foreign to everybody even nowadays right it's like right so i go next door to my neighbor and he's a a white older gentleman and you know he was retired and we would always have these great stories he would always tell me these great stories and so uh we had a really good relationship and i go hey mr tracy like i don't know what form goes in what envelope can you help me out And he's like, oh, taxes, I don't even know them. And I'm like, but you're white. How can you not know, right? (laughs) Yes, as white people, we just are born with knowledge about taxes. You know, (laughs) that's what you're led to believe. Like, you know, and and so I just thought that my parents didn't know because they didn't know the language. And I thought I didn't know because I was young. But at the same time, it was like, it was mind blowing to me that here's an older, you know, 
white individual born here or raised here and knew the language, and yet he didn't know the tax forms. So that was my first clue that taxes were difficult, right? I love and you so, already, Sue. Hey, yeah. Love and so you. I just I took it upon me to really learn, and then I started finding mistakes in my dad's return. And so I was like, you know, I'm just going to do them myself. And so here I am at like you know 14, 15, learning how to file my parents' tax returns. And then I started working right at 15 and a half. So then I started filing my own taxes. And so it just became this thing where I just love to fill out these forms. You know, I thought it was kind of fun at first. And so never did I say, oh, I'm going to be a tax preparer. I'm going to be, you know, in the tax world or anything like that. But when um, I had my, my, my son, I was 23 and I needed a side hustle. You know, I needed to make more money. And I'm like, hey, well, I've always done taxes. Let me get licensed. And uh, I'll start making some extra cash. And that's how it originally happened, where people were just hitting me up and saying, hey, I heard you do taxes. Can you do mine? And I'm like, well, I only, I only do my mom's, my dad's, the neighbors, you know, friends, whatever. And they're like, yeah, but, you know, I heard that you're really good and I want to I want you to do my taxes. So I started to realize that it was foreign to many people. People just didn't understand taxes and their forms. And that's where, because I spent the time learning them and then explaining them to my parents, not just in another language, but to explaining it to somebody that really doesn't know forms and stuff that ended up helping me. Cause now when everybody comes into me to do their taxes, I explain to them the forms, the numbers, what are they saying about you? What are they talking about your finances? How much is uncle Sam really taking from you? And is there anything out there that you could potentially do to make a difference on that return? And so people love the fact that I explain their taxes to them. No one's ever explained them to them. And so now they're starting to lose that fear, mm. that, uh, which is what I love. That's my passion right there. Yes. So there's three things I've jotted down as you're talking. And the first part, which you know I'm giggling at, and just for the listeners, I grew up in Southern California, so I have a lot of Mexican friends. And what she just said is so that is how things were perceived and you know my peer group or whatever but i just want to take what she said about that because it's not unique to this one demographic we all have beliefs that we the stories that we tell ourselves about other people and their qualifications and a lot of times you know women defer to men or maybe we think um because they're a lawyer they know this or like well they've got this kind of a job or they make this amount of money and we start to tell ourselves these stories about other people. And and that also could be from conditioning of like <laughs> cultural conditioning. It can be, you know, conditioning from our generation or whatever that is or our gender, whatever that is. And so what I have found beautifully through coaching and, and through students um, in, in our training programs and that sort of thing is the minute that people see, oh, that person doesn't know anything more than I do or barely more than I do, that's when you start to be empowered to say, well, I can solve that problem just as good as that person. Let's go. Like that, that was powerful. Yeah. Um, and then the second thing, I guess there's really just two things, the beliefs and conditioning, I guess would go together, but that the power that you brought to people was that education. Right. That you, you didn't just do it and be like, here it is, go on with your life. It's that you were able to communicate that. So would you say that's like a key differentiator of you even still to this day? Definitely, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I'll touch more on that, but I want to go back to your first point. I want to tell you that in the 20 plus years that I've been doing this, I'm very observant. I'm very relationship-based kind of individual. And I'll tell you right now that there's so many things that we're conditioned or we tell ourselves and um, and entrepreneurs especially. And I'm here to tell you that, man, my wealthiest client is not gonna be the client that has made the most money. Right. My wealthiest client is the client that knew how to manage their money. And I tell clients, it's not about how much you make, it's about what you do with your money that really matters. And I always share his story because he is, you know, a custodian at a public school or was a custodian at a public school and you know, his salary was like 70000 or so for the year. Like his whole life, he's always made what we call a consider an average salary. Mm -hmm. But he was able to buy 12 rentals throughout the years that he was that he bought himself and shaved off five years of his retirement. So he retired five years early 
because he built an asset, a portfolio of real estate where he started to cash flow from them and build and, and retire early and say, I don't have to go to work anymore, you know? But when I tell people that, you know, they need to, you know, look at their finances and generate extra cash flow or do something or, or change something, they always feel like, feel like, I don't make that kind of money. And I'm like, well, what kind of money do you think you need to be making in order to start to create those assets? And they always assume that they have to be making hundreds of thousand dollars a year. And I'm like, that's not true. I'll tell you that during the crisis of 2008, when the market crashed and all that stuff was happening in 2009, when people were losing like their homes and foreclosures, and it was just such a devastating time. The family that I'll never forget is a professional married another professional. So they're a half a million dollar family on W-2. One professional, 200, the other one, 280, something like that, 300,000. So combined, they were making $500,000 a year. And you're thinking, man, if I made $500,000 a year, I'd be set, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that that's not true. Yeah. Um, their lifestyle was just more expensive, right? They had the bigger house, the nicer cars. But when all of that was happening, their house was getting foreclosed. Their car was getting repoed. We were all going through this crazy time. And it was sad to see that even if you were making half a million dollars a year or $70,000 a year, we were all still struggling. So money didn't really, how much money you made did not matter. It's what you did with your money that truly made that difference. But we tell ourselves the more money you make, the better it's going to be. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't change your habits, you're just going to have more expensive expenses, you know? So we really have to look at where is the money going? What are we doing? And what little changes can we do year after year to improve our overall finances? Gotcha. Yeah. So I'm a um, somebody who has had a budget coach over the years. Mm -hmm. I've done budget coaching for my business. I've gone to financial literacy classes. I mean, I I had a 433 credit score in 1999 and now it's like 830 something you know right. and and so I mean I'm personally living proof of you can be completely clueless I was a teen mom I just all my car was almost repossessed all the time because you just I didn't have enough money to cover what I had to pay I had no help it was just me I was working multiple jobs there was no more there was no more I could do to bring in more money I was doing all that I could do and the, the bills were just more than what I could handle um and so now it's like there is that. And I know that you, you talk about like the the money mindset and the fears and, and the conditioning as children. And my parents didn't, you know, a lot of people say my parents didn't know how to manage money. So they never taught me how to manage money. So can you talk through that? And like, where do people need to get like no matter where they are? So say they're making a ton of money like the one couple, but they're just not spending wisely or there's somebody who's not making enough money and their 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 money runs out before the month does. What what's kind of like your overarching advice? So I mean, it's it starts with the it starts with us, like you said, conditioning. We uh -huh. have to look at um we have to look at money and and treat it a little bit different. So when I tell some of my clients, money is not hard to make, right? But we all feel that money is hard to earn or hard to make. It's yeah. just we were told that we were told money is evil. We were told, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. And so all these other things that we tell ourselves makes us believe that it's just so hard to go out there and earn that money. And and believe me, there's there's times that it does feel that way. But you have to remember that is that, you know, we can't we have to attract it, not push it away. Yeah. And so um, but when when I meet with clients, I always have to tell them that it's crazy that I sometimes have a bigger vision or have a bigger I, I see bigger opportunities that they even see themselves because we get caught up in our everyday. We get caught up in that rat race. My business owners get caught up so much in the business instead of working on the business that we don't see the big picture. We don't come up with those million dollar ideas because we're so cluttered with all of the other chaos. So the first thing I always tell them is you have to pause and take a deep breath and allow yourself to see the bigger picture, the bigger opportunities, the, the things where you're missing out on. We all have things that we can either cut back on or or opportunities where you can go make more money. I will always tell my clients, I'd rather you go make more money than create a budget and cut back, right? But sometimes we have to start, not that I want you on a budget, it's controlling the habits that we have that are important. 
Um, and because sometimes the minute, the minute you make a dollar, you want to just go spend it, right? Because those are habits. And so you have to learn to figure out where those weaknesses are. But it's all about working with ourselves first before we can we can actually see that big picture and make those changes in our business, in our household. Um, but it's uh, it's not something that it's very much talked about out there. And that's, I think, also, we're not taught in school how to manage our money. Yeah. Uh, like you said, we learned parents- the Pythagorean theorem or whatever it is. Like, <laughs> oh, let me just whip that out. I need that today. Let me just figure <laughs> out how to diag, you know, take apart a triangle and put it back together. That's super helpful. Yeah. But we don't learn how to balance a checkbook or... I think yeah. my son did have like personal finance in high school, maybe one semester. Right. No, I want, you know, one of the major homeworks I give my clients when they first come in is you have to read things like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? And not that it's, yes, it's a real estate book because they're like, well, I'm not in real estate. It's not about real estate. It's about, he explains it in a very simple English way where you can read it and be like, oh, I understand that, you know, how taxes work, or I understand that I have to generate extra income in order to be able to do other things um, to make some major changes. So that's why I like that book. Um, But there's others out there. And I'm all about self-development and I'm all about the money mindset so that we can figure out what those little things that, you know, resonate with us and those changes that we can do in our personal life. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I'll, you know, I'll just admit like money is still not my strongest point. It's just not like I'm not driven by money. Yeah. I'm way too generous. Way too generous. I just like <laughs> you need it, you can have it. I don't need it. I'll just do with that. It's fine. Like you yeah. can have it. If you're if you're struggling, then you can have it. Like I'm you know, it's it is a problem. But like even the work that I do, like obviously has a price and I do expect fair compensation. But honestly, if I didn't have a team and I know that you work with service-based businesses, if I didn't have a team or mouths to feed, but- I'm not sure that I would be driven by money enough to even charge what I'm worth. And I'm yeah. saying this as the queen of confidence, not because I don't want to be paid fairly or that i devalue myself but like the end game for me is not cash the end game is transformation in a person's life so how do you talk to people like me who are in service-based businesses when they are just you know as I like to say I just go to la la land and if everybody's happy and I've done my job then great and it's like okay well you have to worry about the money part too which of course I do now yeah that wasn't always the case so I mean I was in the same boat like you know I'm the oldest of five girls I'm a mom I mean, it's it's not that I woke up and I was like, oh, this is this is how life needs to be. I've had major struggles and money for me was one of the biggest struggles because I wanted to help everybody. And I would be like, oh, just pay me one hundred dollars, you know, and, you know, do this and do that. And so for a long time, I had a lot of limiting beliefs. I had a lot of self-worth issues. Right. And so but it goes back to our culture, it goes back to upbringing, you know, whatever stories we tell ourselves. So I had to work on myself. That was one thing. The other thing was I've had coaches throughout my career and the business is only five years old, but I've graduated my coaches, you know, um, you know, throughout the years. And even though some of them will tell me the same thing over and over, because obviously they see the same problems, some coaches explain it to you in such a way that it it just clicks. And that's what happened about two years ago when I hired one of my other coaches. But I read the book, um, We Should All Be Millionaires by Rachel Rogers. I love her. I love her so much. Yes. So I ended up hiring her as a coach. This woman just cracks the whip and says, look, this is what you're trying to achieve. And you're not going to get there when you have when you're doing this. And so what was really hard and what changed for me was allowing myself and giving myself the permission of hiring help because I wanted to do it all. I thought I had to clean the house. I thought I had to wash the dishes. I thought I had to do the laundry. And even though I could, and because my mom did it, I wanted to do it. And so she was the one that was pointing out to me like, look, you're not doing your family a service by trying to do everything because you don't have time for them because you're so busy at work and then you go home and you're so busy at home. So why are you building your business? I'm like, well, I want to I wanna have more so I can spend more time with my family or I could be home with my family or I'm doing it for my kids. So when they start to break it down and I had always given my why, my why is my kids, my family, you know, wanting to be able to provide more. I, the, the people I was stealing the time from was my kids, was That's my right. family. 
So if that's why I'm building this. I'm already failing because that's who's suffering, you know? And so I had to learn that I had to build my worth in order to, instead of working four hours, I can work one hour or two hours, cut my time in half so I can go home and be with my kids. And so when I started to realize that, that I needed to be able to do something like that because then I serve everybody better. I serve myself better. I'm not as crazy and chaotic. <laughs> I'm home with the kids, which they love. I could be home to make dinner, which was one of my major goals. I had to realize that I had to build my worth. I had to build more so that I could be there and be able to do what I'm supposed to be doing, why I'm building this, right? So it, like one thing would tie to the other and to the other. And so when I would take these breaks of, okay, it's me, it's my time, I always wanted to work. And because I wanted to make money, I wanted to be there. But when I would stay back now and take those pauses and really talk about what I wanted to do, man, the ideas I would come back with to the office and I'd be like, we're gonna be doing this and we're gonna be providing this kind of service to the clients and we're gonna be doing that. The value there, those million dollar ideas were just grander, better and more, I don't know, I just, I was so much more passionate about them because they came from a clear mindset and then I can come back and I would build the business according to those. And so the business has grown to the point where I'm not ex exhausted, I'm not working like crazy, but yet I'm producing, I'm working with clients that value my service yeah. and I'm very happy where I'm at. And I get to go home and make dinner if that's what I wanna do or have dinner with the kids. So it's like, it all ended up lining up in a sense, right? And like you said, money wasn't my main thing but money fell where I needed to fall in order for me to be able to achieve those other things. Yeah, and money I to realize provides that. freedom. Yeah. And choices. Did you realize that? I needed yeah. to realize that with money, even though money was not my main thing and I wanted to help more people, I needed to realize that I needed to make that kind of money in order for me to give back, in order for me to have free seminars, in order for me to have free educational workshops, in order for me to make the time to go out and give back but I needed to have that financial support in order to be able to do that. And like I said, when I read that book, oh my gosh, it was like highlighted, tagged, so and it was just resonating and sticking with me in, in many different ways. I don't I don't think I've read that book yet. I, I have some of her programs, um, but I don't think I've bought that book. So I'll, we'll definitely put that in the show notes as well as Rich Dad, <laughs> Poor Dad. Uh, and then I will, of course, download Rachel's book as well. She's such a baddie. So when I was in corporate, my first several businesses or handful of businesses, I should say, I was young. I mean, as a celebrity event planner, I had a whole company in my late 20s and that wasn't even my first company. So I'm a serial entrepreneur, as many of us are. And but then in between, I also work for companies. And so I learned like there's there's like the director of finance and then there's like the director of accounting and then like somebody else entirely does the taxes. And so like there's like these three areas. And I was like, well, what are all these people for? It's like, well, they forecast. Well, what's forecasting? Well, they yeah. decide like what what we have to generate in revenue and where all that money is going to go. And then like bookkeepers and accounting like that's like, you know, really about, OK, where did where did the money go? And let's categorize it and that sort of thing. And then tax, that's like a whole other bear altogether. So when I think about my business, that's where I go in terms of like, okay, well, we budget so we can forecast and then we have, you know, tools to do the bookkeeping and I pay, every, you know, the first hire you should do is your money person, <laughs> either help like a, a VA or something to take things off. And then you need help with your money. Like if you're a business right. owner, that's my opinion. Um, it's not, it's not fact. Where do you, when, you, when you're working with a service-based business, how do you help them see their scope of responsibility when it comes to like the fiduciary responsibility they have to the business? So we try in our firm, we try to we try to be a one stop shop as far as that goes. Right. We try to take off the books off their hands if we can, you know, the payroll. And it's it's more than tax preparation. It's tax planning, just like you talk about forecasting. Right. We got to project where you're going. And in order for me to project to know where you're at and where you're going is I need numbers. So that's where the bookkeeper comes into play, right? I can't, they're telling the books, people do their bookkeeping to do a tax return because we're required to provide a tax return. 
I'm saying do your books because they're trying to tell you a story. Right. They're trying to tell you whether you're running a successful business or a business that's bleeding out your savings or running up your credit cards or is going to fail. And But before that happens, you have time to make changes. And every month, if you run your books every month, every month you account for the money that comes in and the expenses that go out, you will know whether you made money or you lost money that month and how, what changes you need to be making for the, the next month. What kind of specials you need to run? What kind of marketing do you need to do? Hmm. Or or if those are giving you the return of your investment, you know, um, I, you know, people are like, well, I put an ad out or I'm running this uh, amazing Facebook ad. Well, what was the return on it? Like, what did it cost you? And what, what, what came back from it? You know, because those things need to be measured in order for you to continue to make these investments. And people fail to do that because all they run is their books just to do a tax return. And I'm like, man, these numbers have a lot more purpose than just trying to satisfy a requirement. You just need to take the time to really work on your business and read those numbers because they're trying to tell you something. And then, you know, the projection, well, where am I going? Do I need to get one more client or do I need to hustle and get 10 clients? When we started our business, we had little post-its everywhere that said, okay, this week I need to go after five clients. And this week I need to, I, you know, go after 10 clients or whatever. But because we were following our numbers when they're trying to tell us that we needed something, my sister would be like, hey, we need new computers. Okay, well, how much are they going to cost? Five grand. Okay, well, how many clients do I need to go get? Don't right. tell me I, I need a budget for this. It's like, no, just tell me how many go cl clients I need to go get. It's because... At that point, I was very proactive, right? When I go networking or when I put on an, um, you know, Facebook post or something, I was very proactive and intentional because I knew that we needed to go get X amount of money in order to buy the computers or whatever it was. Yeah. And that made me a lot more, I don't know, it's just intent, right? You just had this, this, this purpose and that helped me a lot. So now I tell clients the same thing is if you're not reading those numbers and understanding what they're trying to tell you, then you're out there working, working, but for what? It, you know, what is it that is coming back? What are those numbers telling you or translating to? And so you start to realize what is your overhead? You know, you start to look at and how much am I really paying myself? Am I paying myself? You know, because some people work out there and they really don't make any money and they're not taking any money home. So you want to make sure that you're paying yourself what you are worth, just like if you were working for somebody else. So just things like that are, are reasons why you need those numbers. I'm big on tax planning with my clients. We've already, you know, uh, forecasted 2024 or we've ended 2023 in December. So we already know what their tax liability will be. We've already planned it out. So tax planning is a good way for you to know um, what Uncle Sam's going to want from you at the end of the year. And then you just plan for it and ignore it. And, and it's done and it's over with. Now let's focus on making more money, right? So tax planning to me is is the number one thing I do with my clients. It's not about the preparation. It's about what are the numbers trying to tell us? Yeah, I love that. And the story of the numbers. Um, oh, yeah. That's it. And and sometimes there are CPAs or bookkeepers who are resistant to sharing that with you. It's like they just want to... They just want to put everything in the right box and keep moving on. And they're not necessarily producing financial statements to help you see forward. So, I, you know, obviously we have somebody right here on the show, uh, <laughs> Suhei, that can help you. Um, but if you're if you just love your person, but you're not getting the numbers that you need, then I strongly encourage you to um, look at that. Like we have yeah. a spreadsheet, a dashboard, like all kinds of yeah. stuff that we we look at. Um, so I, I feel like I talk to you all day long because this is <laughs> you know it is it's just like this it's a topic for me personally but it's a topic for me as we were talking before the show that it's a topic for like almost well I won't say almost everyone that I work with but a lot of people that I work with knowing your numbers so what would be before we tell everybody how to get a hold of you and where they can find you online what would be your parting piece of advice that you would give to a bombshell or an aspiring bombshell, a bold, brave, unwaveringly confident woman in business? You know, us women, we're, we're amazing, right? Um, we want to do it all. But I, you know, one very important lesson that I had to learn the hard way, but, you know, uh, as entrepreneurs, we're so stubborn because we can do it all. Um, but one and very important thing is, you know, we have to take care of ourselves. 
it's not being selfish, but we really have to look out for ourselves okay. because without us, then our kids have nobody, our spouses have nobody, the business doesn't have that person that they need. So self-care, uh, whether it's mind, spiritual, your health, you know, body, whatever you want it to be. I mean, all of them, if we can align them all would be great. But if we don't protect ourselves, then well, you know, we're not serving anybody else. So I I'm really a big believer that the stronger and better you are, the more you can carry. So take care of yourselves, put yourselves first, and everything else will fall in place. Yeah. I needed to hear that this week too. I'm usually really good about that, but woo. <laughs> You know, fall off, fell off the um, the wagon this past couple of weeks. I'm on the struggle bus, so I, I needed to hear that. I thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Now we can find you on LinkedIn, um, mm-hmm. and that is Suhey. It's spelled S U G E Y and Piedra P I E D R A. Of course, all of this is in the show notes, so you can check it out. Like if you listen to. Um, Apple Podcasts, it's it's in there. You can go to amberhurl.com forward slash podcast with an S and show notes can be found there. Just look for this episode and all of these links will be there. It's Prominence B Management on Facebook and Prominence.services on Instagram. And you are prominencebusiness.com for your fabulous website. Um, I love the video on there and all of the images <laughs> and everything. This, this is really great. And you're really, really great. So um, Thank you. Yeah. is there any, th- any other places they can find you or any other um, thing you want to share before we part ways? You know, we're very active on social media. We try to put the message out there as much as possible that, you know, we should not be fearing the IRS or our taxes. Instead, we should use them to empower us. So uh, follow our social media and um, message us if you need anything. The business is Women Doe and my sisters and I own the business. And we're very caring individuals. So, you know, we, we pride ourselves to saying, you know, with us, we're just a team of caring. You know, we're family. So, you know, we I don't love- just do it to serve a purpose. We want to really make sure people understand that they're Numbers shouldn't be scaring you. Your finances should not be scaring you. Should be empowering you. I love it. I love that. I I love your heart. I love your energy. I'm I'm just I feel privileged to even have the opportunity to have this conversation with you because I know you're doing really really good work in this world, helping awesome. a lot of people. But thank no, you. Thank you, Amber. Thank you for having me. Love for the sure. opportunity to be here. Absolutely. Well, bombshells. Um, you know what to do from here. If something popped out at you in this episode, share it. You share it on social media. If somebody you know really needs, maybe they just started a business, you want to help them get off on the right foot and be like, you have to prioritize the money. That's the whole point of business. Or maybe you know somebody who's just been super stressed out, they're working way too hard, and maybe they need to hear this so that they can figure out how to work smarter, not harder, and make their money work for them better. Then share this episode. It's so important that we help our fellow bombshells and that we connect in that way. And um, make sure always, if you're watching this on YouTube, even if you just give it a like or you put a comment on there, I know we don't have a huge audience on YouTube because we don't put a lot of attention over there. Um, But if you do, that helps Google be like, oh, we should pay attention to this. And same with wherever you listen to your your podcast on whichever app. So just go over there and help a sister out so that we can help more sisters out. (laughs) And on that note, I will see you on the next episode.